My name is uh, Jamie Barker, and uh, I was born and raised here in Boise, Idaho. I'm a retired uh, deputy with the uh, Ada County Sheriff's Office, and uh, born and raised here in Boise. What else do you want to know? <laughs> okay. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, about uh, growing up, what your family life was, uh, was like, and uh, was there anything that drew you to law enforcement? Sure. So... Um, I am a, a third generation uh, Boise native. Um, my dad grew up in Boise. His dad grew up in Boise. I was born at St. Luke's Hospital downtown. Um, and uh, so I've got lots of roots here in town. Um, and uh, so went to McKinley Elementary School as a child. Went to Jolly Time Kindergarten, which they didn't have kindergarten in the schools back in the day. Um, and so you had to go to Mrs. Stan's jolly time, you know, kindergarten. Anyway, I did that and, and fine. And then, uh, went to McKinley Elementary, uh, went to West Junior High after that. Both of those buildings are demolished. They're gone. They no longer exist. And that's something. Um, and, uh, then I went to, um, Bora High School, graduated from Bora High in 1982 um, and so during my during my school years um, pretty much everything normal we went camping uh, we we did stuff I'm the youngest of four sons um, uh, so it was just my brothers Dale David Dennis me and mom and dad and uh, my grandma lived not too far away, and so I, I mowed grandma's grass, you know, on occasion, and, you know, uh, stuff like that. Rode bikes around. We played in the neighborhood until it was dark, um, and then went home. As soon as the, the night, you know, the street lights came on, it's time to go home. And so we did that. Um, it was a pretty cool place to live and uh, pretty quiet. Now, every once in a while, um, there would be, you know, um, I remember as a, as a kid riding in, uh, mom and dad's, uh, station wagon. They had an old Dodge Monaco station wagon. Uh, and, um, mom and I were in that car, no seat belts, because why, right? Um, and, uh, we were going down Orchard Street. Uh, right between uh, Franklin and the railroad tracks and we were going south and off to the side there was now there's a Fred Myers right there in that area uh, but before that there was it was a, a shopping mall still but it was you know Falk's ID and the bazaar and stores like that um, and there was on the side of the road a Boise police car. Now, back in the day, uh, I remember um, they had the red and blue bubbles on the top, rotating light bars, just one light on each side of the car, passenger and driver side of the car, and they had these lights going. And of course, I looked at that. I thought that was cool. I still do. Um, if you've seen my office, you'll know why. I, I've got lots of those lights in my in my office. Anyway. Um, the uh, there was a an ambulance also, and this was one of those Cadillac station wagon. Looks like a hearse, but it wasn't. It was red. I think it was an Ada boy. Um, you know, they didn't have Ada County paramedics back in the day. They were a private company that contracted for paramedic service. And so um, here's this these this rig over here with a with a big red light on the top of it rotating, and I don't know what had happened. There was a car on the side of the road. Anyway, there was a, a person down on the ground. Um, and as we're driving by, I see paramedics draw a sheet up over this dead person because they were dead. They covered it over just, just like on TV. And uh, I, I thought, wow. And I was probably seven, six. It was one of my first ever memories. 
and and uh, um, of a police related thing, and uh, and I remember the uh, the Boys Police Officer. They wore a a light blue shirt with the dark epaulets and pocket flaps and dark blue trousers and stuff. And I was just looking at them, and as I later on, as I you know had contact with the police as a youth if I saw a cop or something my eye was always you know just directed or focused on all the bling that they had on the badge and the whistle chain and the and the buckle and the gun and all that stuff and it was like man I was just like you know I was always enthralled by those people um and so I think just just having that kind of awe for for those folks early on um and even as a as a little kid you know i remember being in the car and if we saw a police car i would holler out Oop, it's the police you gotta stop you know that sort of thing you know and and anyway but a, a pretty pretty innocent you know childhood through you know through junior high and, and you know stuff and and we had a uh, we had a school resource officer at West Junior High, and his name was uh, Manny Martinez. And Manny Martinez was a, was with Boise PD, and um, and I was I was a little shit, you know, kinda. I mean, kinda, but um, ended up having to talk with Manny Martinez one of the one time and and he he kind of said hey you know you need you know watch out whatever you know just be a better person kind of visit and uh, but he wore a uniform uh, to school uh, at least he did on that particular day and again it was like you know there's that stuff and I was always looking at that stuff I'm like that's kind of cool star you know all that stuff and so you know um, and then the other influence was, uh, Adam 12 was on TV. You had Reed and Malloy and, you know, Chips, Ponch and John. You had, you know, this show called The Rookies. And I don't remember the character names, but I watched it every week. And, you know, these cop shows, and I wanted to be a motor cop, you know, in junior high. I was like, man, this is, I want to do that. I remember that. Um. And then I dismissed a lot of that stuff and went through high school and, and you know, I wasn't really into sports a whole lot. I was more, I was one of those guys that was into speech and debate um, and more into, I was, I did drama for a while and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then after high school, I graduated from high school and uh, I served a mission, an LDS mission, um, for, at that time it was for a year and a half, um, and I was, uh, went to the Hawaii Honolulu mission, and that was fun, that was, that was a great time. Um, one of the things, just to back up a little bit, in high school, um, there was a gal that I met, she was, I was a junior and she was a sophomore, and her name is Ginger. And she was just, you know, she's kind of a, you know, a cool kid, and we kind of hung out and stuff like that, and we went to dances and movies and all kinds of things, and we just kind of dated pretty much through high school, and uh, um, so I left on my mission. I come back, you know, a year and a half later. It's June of '84, and you know, there she is. She's still there, and and so we start dating again. And probably a year later, we get married. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, and we've had four kids and, you know, we're still, and we're old now. And, <laughs> uh, but yeah, she's, she's still hanging out. She's a good kid, but you know. Um, but anyway, so those are kind of the early influences that kind of, started me, you know, going towards the law enforcement thing. And then when I came home from my mission, it was kind of like, okay, what are you going to do? What, what's, what, what am I going to do with my life? 
And I talked with some folks, and, and uh, I saw that Boise State had a criminal justice administration program, and I, so I was like, well, maybe I'll, no, I'll look at that. So I enrolled at Boise State, and I went to school there for about a year, and uh, then I got married, and then the budget kicked in, and I was like, Ugh. Um, but shortly after I got home from my mission in June of 84, uh, I, my, my mom, um, who ran a daycare, um, had as a client a Boise police uh, detective's child that stayed at her home. And his name is Sh uh, Shane Hartgrove. And, and uh, so I got to meet Shane Hartgrove, and he worked checks, checks and frauds detectives at, at Boise PD. And uh, he told me about, hey, there's a reserve program that we've got at Boise PD, and it's a really cool program. You can learn stuff, and, and you get to wear the uniform, and you get to ride in, in a police car with, you know, a training officer and all kinds of stuff. And there's a, you know, there's a whole process as far as getting hired on and stuff like that, because you're, you're not really working for money. You're just getting experience and whatnot. So um, I tried that. I uh, went through that hiring process. took four months. Uh, I was sworn in uh, on Halloween of 84, October 30th, 1984, as a Boise Police Reserve Officer, and uh, I did that for five years um, as I worked in other vocations. I worked at a video store and uh, ended up working for the Meridian School District as their very first parking lot security guy at Meridian High School. I worked for Bob Haley. Um, and uh, and uh, so I was doing Reserve, we had reserve meetings, and we had to do a certain number of hours and things like that. And I was, you know, I was writing tickets, and I was, you know, learned, you know, all the stuff that you got to learn, you know, building search and how to shoot a gun and, you know, all of that stuff, how to how to drive, all all, all of that fun, you know, cop stuff. And, and apparently I was, I was pretty good at it, I guess. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And I, I, it was kind of addictive. I remember riding in a, uh, a a light blue Chevy Impala with uh, my my very first training officer Dave Hamilton, and um, we made a traffic stop. This is my very first traffic stop. Of course, Dave was driving, and uh, he was running radar uh, over near Twenty Third and Pleasanton in Boise. Believe it or not, I remember that stuff. And he makes this T-stop, and, and he's like, oh, he, he, he gets him on the radar, and he's like, oh, yeah, okay, that's a good one. And it's a speeder, right? And what they're doing, like 15 over, maybe, whatever. And, and I'm sitting in the, in the passenger seat, and I'm not, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I'm going to do, right? I mean, we've practiced, okay, approaching the car, what you're supposed to do, all that stuff. I knew that, but I've never been in, in a car that's, you know, we're going after somebody. And the adrenaline dump was sublime it really was it was like you know because here he they dumped it into into drive and yeah, I hit the gas and we're like going and the lights were on and i'm like man this is i am i'm doing this <laughs> and you know what i'll tell you that feeling of i am doing i am in this car doing this with the lights on i'm doing this I still had that feeling the week before I retired. <laughs> it was like, wow, I'm still doing this. It's pretty cool. Anyway, um, we did that T-stop and, you know, I did what I was supposed to do and, and we did a critique and I, wa and, and I watched Dave fill out the, the ticket and everything. And he says, okay, on the next one, you're filling out the ticket. And I'm like, what? He said, no, you're going to fill out the ticket. You're going to do it. And I'm like, okay. And so from that experience, you know, onward and upward, we just kind of keep going. And um, in the last, you know, probably three years of that five-year stint, um, I, I was allowed to come into the station, you know, check out a car and, and go hit the street and do stuff. Check in with the sergeant say, hey, I'm here. Do you want me to do something? Where do you need me? I'll just go over here and run. You know, watch a stop sign or do some, you know, whatever. And and that was cool, you know, because I had a little bit of autonomy. And I remember a lieutenant uh, one time 
Pat Brown said, you know, on the air, uh, they needed they needed somebody at an at an accident, um, and he gets on the Carter Car Channel and he says, send Barker, he's he's available, send him, and and the sergeant said, okay, Barker, it's it's yours, but you need to go code three. I'm like, oh, are you kidding? Hit the lights, and I was I was driving very responsibly. Very conservative code run. It was not my car, and I was very aware. I don't want to break this car, you know. I remember one time, oh, oof. You know, sometimes we make mistakes, right? I remember a time when I was in the reserves, and I was, and I was, I was having a fun time being a reserve, and I was doing shit that probably, you know, somebody needed to say, you need to knock that off. Um, and a guy said, you need to knock that off. And it happened to be uh, Vance Taylor, um, a senior Boise police guy. I respect him. He, uh, he was mayor of his town at one point. Um, uh, Vance Taylor, a highly respected uh, patrolman, um, and uh, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was talking about. And he was rolling Code 3 to a traffic accident over on State Street near, I don't know, 27th area and uh, I was close I thought I'm gonna jump that call and it was Vance's call so I hit the lights and I hit the siren and I I, 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 I keyed up on the radio you know my call sign and I said I'm close to that call um, I can go and I didn't get a response back but I wasn't really listening for a response back. And I was just going. And Vance comes this way, and I'm right on him, and I had to hit the brakes. And I can tell you that, that um, oh, we, got, we pulled up to the accident scene. Vance pulls up. I pull in behind him. Um... I, I get out of the car and I'm expecting, Vance gets out of the car and I'm expecting him to walk up to the accident scene. He doesn't. He walks right back to me and he's pissed. He's genuinely angry at me um, because of the stupid thing that I did. And, and he said, he said, I can't remember what he said, all of it, but he said, um, words to the effect of, Oh, I can't even remember what he said, but it was really bad, and it made me feel bad, and which I should have felt bad because that was not a good thing to do. Um, but uh, he made it very clear that um, that that was not acceptable at all, and um, I thought, "Oh crap!" And I just like, and I just, oh man! And so I sculp, sculp back into my car. And I turn off them lights, and I put it in, and I, I'm not even helping him with the wreck. I'm like, oh, I got to go. You know, and I did, and I drove back to the station. And all the way back to the station, I'm like, oh, he is going to, he, they're going to roast me. He is going to roast me, and he is going to tell everybody that, um, that is in charge of me what I did, and I am, this is going to be the last time I ever wear this Boise Police Reserve uniform ever, and I felt like that. It was that was serious, and uh, um, he never said a word to anybody, ever, ever about it. And I thought, you know, I and I just knew that Vance Taylor hated my guts. That that he spit whenever he heard my name, if he did. But I saw him. Um, later on, maybe a month later, I saw him and I was like, ooh, that's the guy that didn't like me. And he comes up and he puts his arm around me. He's like, how you doing, kid? I'm good. Good. And I'm scared. And then he's like, um, you know, and everything was cool. And he never really said anything to anybody about that. And it was just between him and me. And it was a learning experience, a good one. Uh, but, you know, that was, you know, that was an early experience that I had there as a reserve. Not no, I mean, I didn't know. I think back about what a dumb shit I was as as a reserve. 
I didn't know anything. I'm amazed that I could walk and chew gum at the same time. Seriously, I was that dumb. Um, but you know, you know, that's when I was I was learning. Right? Just just for context, so in '84 yeah. when you get hired on, how old are you? So I'm uh, 22 in November. I turned 22 in uh, 1984. So I was I was stupid. Seriously, just dumb. I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, not not good. Um, so yeah, young young guy, just kind of learning stuff. And it seems like for me, I have to I have to, you know, crack my head a few times uh, before I learn something. I don't know what it is. It just that's how I learn. I'm a visual learner, but I am also a I learn by doing. And sometimes I have to make the mistakes in order to learn. That's not how you do that. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, people were patient with me, far more patient than I think I would be, you know, with me. <laughs> But I'm thankful for them, all right? Uh, but, you know, um, you know, and then, and then we, we move forward in time. And uh, I, one of the a job that I have, I'm working for the Meridian School District as their parking lot security guy at Meridian High School. Working for Bob Haley, who was the principal there. He later turned into an administrator for that school district and, and uh, uh, a good guy, a good boss. Um, but one of the ways, and he interviewed me for, for this position, uh, they didn't, they never had a security, a parking lot security person before. And my, my duties there were to watch the cars in the parking lot, watch the traffic flow, you know, make sure that, you know, you know, non-students weren't parking in there. They had parking permits and things like that. And I could write a little warning note, and put it on their car if they, if they were bad or whatever. Anyway, but in exchange, uh, or, or as a way to uh, pay for that position, um, um, they, they took um, the money from the daily take from the numerous candy and pop machines, vending machines that they had at, in the school. And that's how they paid for my spot. Well, thank goodness those kids had sweet tooth because, you know, it, it, it paid for my job. But in, in order to make that work, one of my collateral duties uh, uh, was to restock those machines, right? So um, during passing period, the rent-a-cop was also the guy putting the Snickers bars in the freaking machines, right? <laughs> You know, um, so that's fine. And, you know, and I, I really took, I, I took offense. I took umbrage in a big way. If somebody called me a rent-a-cop, <gasps> how dare you? And I was very sensitive about that. It's funny. You know? I was like, really? Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I was, uh, I took myself far too seriously, I think. Um, but I met some really cool people there. Not, I mean, you know, the faculty was fine. Um, but, um, the people that I met that, that I refer to as cool people were the students. There were a number of students at Meridian High School, um, that were seniors, uh, or juniors that I later on in my career in law enforcement, I came to be close friends with a number of them. And they remember me from when I was the the, the parking lot the rent a cop dude that put candy bars in the freaking machines. You know that was me. And so um, and some of those guys I met uh, um, a student named Mike Rossi uh, and a student named Mike Kinzel, a couple of Mikes, and then there's another one, Rich, Richie Rice. Uh, and they all they all work for the county. Um, two of them were cops, and one was the uh, uh, chief electrician for the maintenance uh, uh, at Ada County, and uh, um, yeah, they would they tell stories about throwing snowballs at me in the parking lot, you know, when they were in high school and, and stuff, and I'd get all mad and whatnot. Um, but uh, yeah, one of them turned out to be my uh, detective partner, believe it or not, uh, for four years. And I worked detective. Uh, pretty cool. And uh, um, 
he's his last day is uh like in like in seven days he's retiring and when did you retire I retired uh, uh, April 30th, it was a Friday, April 30th of 2015. And uh, that, was, that was great because I, I, had, I had been in contact with Percy and they had a state check for me, a Percy check, and I got the county check on the same day. It was cool. I loved it. That was a great day. <laughs> and so what, so moving on in your mm -hmm. career, what took you to Idaho State Police? So um, when I was working, so working at uh, uh, in the in the school district, um, so Meridian High School was the was the first school that I worked at, and then there was a new high school that was under construction, um, Centennial High School, and so the next year Centennial High School opened up, and Jim Carberry was going to be the principal there, and he approached me uh, to be the the parking lot security guy there, and I said, sure, I'll go to the new school. It was closer to my house, so um, not so much of a commute. So yeah, good. Well, Centennial High School at that time uh, was uh, in unincorporated Ada County, um, and I was, you know, I, I had been, I had been in this school thing now for going on two years. We're we're, we're running into uh, into the second year here, and. Um, and I was just kind of like, I need to move on. I, I would like to find a job, a, a paying police job as a policeman somewhere, you know. And so I, uh, I saw that Idaho State Police was hiring. And I, uh, I put in an application and I tested for them. And I did, you know, all the stuff that you're supposed to do, the psych and the PT and the, all of that stuff. Did all that stuff. And um, I found that I was kind of, they had, they had like, like 10 openings and I was number 11 on their, on their candidates list. And so I was like, shoot, I missed out. Well, and that was, that was like in, um, in the August, September of, of that year. And, um, in November, I get a phone call from um, Ralph Powell, who was the uh, personnel sergeant. He was later the, uh, the what, colonel of uh, ISP. And Ralph Powell calls me up and says, hey, we got a, we got a spot that's, that's opened up. Are you interested? And I say, yes, I am. And uh, uh, he said, so... Uh, We'll, we'll just kind of, we'll start you on X date. And I said, okay, I need a couple of weeks to give these guys, uh, you know, some notice. That's fine. Um, so you report here, you know, whenever. And this was at the uh, District 3 office over on, uh, over off of uh, Cole Road and Century Way. Um, anyway, so, so I, I, I tell everybody at uh, Centennial High and the school resource officer, a really good guy, a county detective, juvenile detective named Steve English, um, a good friend. Um, uh, I said, yeah, ISP is hiring and they've, uh, they've offered me a position and I'm going. And everybody was like, all right, good, good luck. See ya. And so there I went and uh, I went, uh, they put me through post and uh, so it was a few months in between. So we had December, January, and February that I was at the District 3 office. And I was doing just office things. Not, I mean, they, they had me on the payroll, but I, I wasn't really doing I was shining cars, and I was doing all kinds of, you know, just piddly stuff. Um, doing a lot of push-ups. Because they have a stress academy. I knew about the stress academy, but I didn't know exactly what it was. Um, and but but I wanted I wanted to get through post and so I did and and uh, post was over here off of Clinton Street near uh, West Junior High at that time. Um, it's not where it is now out of Meridian, um, and it was one of those where you do have to stay and it was like a six week academy I believe and you have to stay there, um, and you could you could go home like on a on a Saturday if there wasn't any training 
you go on, home on a Saturday, you have to come back Sunday evening. So that's fine. Uh, we did that and actually actually did pretty well. Uh, had some really good scores at post and I shot really well. I was the only person there that shot pistol expert um, on that class. Um, and so uh, it was a really good experience. Um, then we rotate into um, the Stress Academy, which was, you know, just we graduated and then it was like the next week roll into the Stress Academy. And that was an environment that I didn't, it was, it was a tougher environment uh, for me personally. And for whatever reason, um, I, I didn't survive there. And, and so I, I pulled the plug. And, um, and it was really, for me, it was, it was, it was disheartening, I think, because um, um, I, I was there was a lot of self doubt about was this really what I want to do? Is this the really the kind of policeman I want to be? Because again, I'd had the the Boise Police Reserve experience, and it was a great, cool, neat experience. And then as I'm learning how to be an Idaho State Police officer. I'm sure had I stuck with it, it would have been a super great, cool, neat experience. And, uh, but in the moment at that time at the Stress Academy, it was, I, I wasn't feeling it. And um, so I pulled the plug and I was hoping for other things. But um, I was, I, I had a lot of self-doubt, a lot of... Um, uh, do I really want to do this kind of thing? Do I want to be a cop? Um, and so for a period of about, so I, I left, I resigned from my SP. So, so Jamie, before you go on, yeah. so post is where you just basically go and you learn to be an officer and they teach you the rules and everything else. Yeah. I never heard of stress academy. So what, right. what is that? So this is a, this is an advanced academy. They call it an advanced academy now. Um, um, so it is training, structured training over and above post. And again, it is a, uh, and this one is a 12 week academy at the time. And this was, you're not going home. You are in a barracks and you are running and you are getting yelled at and there are people are ripping your bed up. And it is all of that. It is, it is much like, um, uh, basic training in, in the military. Um, inspections, you must have your, everything must be shined, all of this stuff that you're supposed to do, right? Um, that's what Stress Academy is like. And it was, it was, it was not an environment that I kind of wanted to be in. Okay. I didn't like it. Okay. That's all I left. All right. And, and so, <laughs> okay. Um, and so, um, so, so now here I am. Sort of like, okay, do I want to be a cop or do I not want to be a cop? Now I've got, I've got um, um, a little kid at home now. My first daughter has been born. Um, uh, I've got a wife who has expectations of, of me and in my life. And what, and what are we going to do? And so um, there was a guy that I knew, a good friend, who I met at, uh, at Boise PD, who was in the crime prevention uh, division, and his name is Craig Huntsman, and he uh, had just been, uh, he had just gotten the position of security director at St. Luke's Hospital downtown, Boise. And so I went into his office, I just went down there cold, um, and knocked on his door, and there's Craig, and, and he says, what are you doing? I thought you were the Idaho, Idaho State Police, and I said, yeah, no. And, uh, um, and I, I said, I kind of talked to him about my experience and, and, and things, and, and again, here's a guy who had the worlds of patience with a guy like me, and, um, and I said, you know, Craig, I'm, I'm looking for something to do, and he says, tell you what, here's, I'll get you some paper, I'd like you to fill it out, plan on starting next Monday, and while I'm in that office with him, he gets on the phone with a guy, another friend, Jim Williston, who runs the cop shop in Boise. He calls Jim Williston. He says, Jim, I got Jamie Barker here in the, uh, in the office, and uh, he's going to need uh, two security uniforms for St. Luke's. 
and he's going to come down and and uh, he's going to come down today and he, you're going to fit him with something and um, whenever we get it then he'll have it. Okay, good. This is without even having an, an application filled out yet or even a line on an application yet. And so he's taking care of me, right? And so I, I walk away from there and I've got this job and it's cool. And it's, it is a job that has um, a mixture of young college students who, who study all shift. <laughs> Those are in the book, you know. Or you got old timer, retired cops, uh, or, or just older folks that are done doing whatever they were doing and now they're doing this. Um, and it was, it was an interesting uh, transitional period for me. Um, it, it kind of helped me um, see a little bit of the other side of the of the equation. Without, am I going to be a cop? That wasn't now the the pressing thought. It was it was what am I going to do now? Where what's my next step? And so, as I was making that assessment and things, um, Steve English, the SRO from Centennial High, he hears that I have left ISP. And he calls me up. He goes, Barker, we need you at Ada County SO. And he said, and I expect, and this is a couple of months after after Huntsman got a hold of me. So I'm feeling okay. And uh, he says, and he says, I expect you to come down. Yeah, I want you to go see Gary Rouse in, in personnel, and I, I need you to pick up an application and fill that thing out and get it back to him. And uh, I, he said, I need you to do that. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I went down there and I, I visited with Gary and he said, look, right now, everybody that we hire at the, at the county is a year later going to Boise PD. So we had this parity thing, this pay thing. And Ada County was the lower pay. The Boise PD paid more. So you train up here and you go over here, right? Well, that was happening. And we just, Ada County had just lost a whole bunch of detectives and senior guys over to Boise P PD Patrol because they were making a lot more money. Anyway, so um, so Rouse tells me, he says, look, if you're, if you're gonna do this, you need to be a county employee and I want you to promise me now that you're not gonna go to Boise PD after we train you up, should we hire you? I don't know that we're hiring you, but if that's the case. And I said, okay, yeah, I promise Gary, no problem. So anyway, we, uh, we go through the hiring process, and it's probably five months from the time I left ISP to uh, starting to work at the Ada County Jail. Um, I, got the, I got the phone call from Lieutenant Dale Woodcook. He calls me up and he says, I'm looking for Jamie Barker. Is this Jamie Barker? And I said, yes, sir, it's Jamie Barker. He says, look, this is, this is Dale Woodcook, Ada County Sheriff's Office. I work in the jail. I need you to come work for me. And this is your day. And he tells me the date. And uh, tells me when, when I'm to report to him. He just come come to my office. And, I, and he says, we'll get you squared away with uniforms and whatnot. So don't worry about that. And he asked me if I had a gun, if I had a duty belt, stuff like that. Yes, I've got all that. Okay, well, you can bring that. All right. Um, so did that. And yeah, and, and that's how I started at, at Ada County. Apparently, and it's on my, uh, I still have the piece of paper uh, that I got, uh, the personnel, the notice of personnel action is the, is the piece of paper that says Jamie Barker is hired um, as a jail deputy, deputy one. Um, and uh, in the comments below, it says, as a replacement for deputy, I can't remember his name, um, <laughs> so I thought, well, that's curious, you know, as a replacement for deputy so-and-so. And so later on, I figured out who deputy so-and-so was. And I said, well, how come I'm replacing deputy so-and-so? What did he do? What, did he tick somebody off? What? And uh, apparently um, there was a law that had just been enacted at the, in, in, in the state of Idaho. And it had to do with smoking in inside buildings, inside the store, and um, inside public places. You know, they kind of stopped, you know, they banned that. You don't get to smoke in there. And so, and one of those places is inside the Ada County Jail. It used to be 
you know, we, they'd sell them tobacco and rolling papers, and you could they could go down there and they could smoke cigarettes down in their jail cell, right? Oh no, new day, new sheriff in town. Yeah, you can't do that now. And so, well, apparently this deputy was um, was selling cigarettes down the pier, <laughs> making a making a, a fair amount of money, and uh, so they canned him and and. Uh, I got to be the replacement guy for that. So, so Jamie, a couple of questions. What, so when did you start working for uh, at the jail? What year? So that would have been in um, it's like 89. Okay. Like November of 89. And then, you know, I'm sort of familiar with this, but you start working at, a, at the jail for the Ada County Sheriff's Office. Yeah. Is there a rule at the time that you have to start in the jail in order to go on patrol and be a patrol officer later on? Um, no. Actually, um, they would hire laterals from other agencies that are that, you know uh, had no jail experience, and they would put them on as a patrol person uh, at, at, the, at the Ada County Sheriff's Office. Now, if you were a new hire, like what they might term off the street, if you are a new off the street hire, um, oftentimes they would, they would, not all the time, but most of the time, they would stick you in the jail um, so that you can learn that. And then it, there, was a, there was kind of a dual career ladder. So you could stay in the jail and work in the jail and make a whole career out of working in the jail. And a lot of people did that and had a great career. Uh, but there were others like me who wanted something more. And again, there was that yearning for the lights on the car, right? Because <laughs> So you worked in the jail for four years. Do yeah. you think that that helped you when you went to patrol and became uh, yeah. okay? In what way? So in the jail, um, you deal with with folks from all walks of life, and you know, in the jail intake in the booking area, which is primarily where I worked, um, you're meeting people who are having a hard day right then right and maybe they're under the influence of alcohol or drugs maybe you're not able to 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 deal with them and having a conversation at all maybe you have to put them in a small holding cell and just let them pound on the door or whatever it is that they do um but from a, a person of my stature i i didn't have that much i mean i had five years as a as a reserve officer so i got a little bit of of you know knowledge of, of that stuff, you know, of, of dealing with people in the, in that, I guess, adversarial sort of way that cops do with, with folks on occasion, um, or that service oriented way. And in the jail, um, it wasn't initially, I'm here to serve you. I'm here to incarcerate you. I'm not here to punish you. Or anything like that, but you're in jail, and we have our rules. And if you if you want to, you know, get to the phone, get to bond out. There's certain things that we must do: photographs, fingerprints, you know, your booking information. You can't lie to us about these things. And if you do, you know, you get to go sit down for a little while, or whatever that is, right? Um, and so it it taught me. Um, number one, to communicate with people, and um, I learned how people communicated with me. The me that's wearing the star. Um, and, and sometimes that was, I mean, you had people that come in and they, they saw the star only. And I think that's pretty much what they saw. They, didn't, they don't know me. They don't know Jamie Barker. They see the uniform. And, you know, maybe they have contempt for the uniform. Maybe they don't. But um, in whatever, whatever situation they might have been in, if it's a domestic violence, they've got other things on their mind, too. Um, how much trouble am I in? If it's a DUI, they don't care how much trouble they're in. They're, you know, they're, I mean, maybe. They're, they're, they're dealing with their situation. Over the course of time, and again, four years, at the very beginning of this, I didn't know near as much as what I knew at the end of it. And at the end of it, um, I recognize that my role as a jail deputy, especially in the intake area, is to assess the people that were coming into the jail and figure out 
um, how it is that I, as a jail deputy, can help them get through this experience. Whereas, um, and I had, I had, I was a training officer at the end of my, uh, my four years. I was training new jail people. And one of the things that I, that I taught, I, I had a new guy. I had a new guy. It was like his second day. And he was kind of cocky. Um, and um, uh, a lieutenant happened to be walking through the booking area as a Boise police officer was bringing uh, some dude in. You know, he's handcuffs, hands behind his back, and the officer's kind of walking him in. <laughs> and this joker says, <laughs> my trainee, he says, well, welcome to the Gray Bar Motel. And I'm like, and the lieutenant looks at me, <laughs> and he's looking at me. He's not looking at this dude. He's looking at me. <laughs> I grab the dude, and I take him into the sergeant's office. He shut the door. And we have a conversation about, you know, we don't say things like that, you know. Um, and, and I guess one of the things that I learned was in that jail setting, um, the service, I mean, it's not, the service is not something that you think about as a jail deputy um, in, in serving these people who are in here for committing a crime. But they need to have some service. They need, they need um, to um, recognize where they are. And maybe some of them know just exactly where they are. But some of these folks don't know where they are. And it's important that they learn where they are. And um, it's important to be respectful to them, um, even in the face of their disrespect of me or of the badge. And, and uh, early on in my four years, I, I didn't really recognize that, but I came to know that, you know, as I, as I worked in that, in that position. Because um, I, I saw deputies who got adversarial with uh, an inmate in the jail. And, you know, they may yell back and forth at each other. And at the end of that, um, where are you? I mean, there, it didn't help anybody. It just hurt. It, it really hurt the, the deputy more than it hurt that guy or whatever. Um, and so I kind of learned that in, 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 in that jail environment. Communication, having people lie to me all of, all of the time. I learned how to recognize when somebody is lying to me. I use that a lot on patrol. And the 8th County Jail, the intake is like a revolving door. You get the same people in all the time. And so um, when I met those people then out on the street as a patrol officer, I knew who they were. And uh, I, could, I could have some, some um, interaction with them, and they knew who I was. And I would remind, remind them of the joke that I told them when they were in the, in the cell or whatever. Um, and we laughed together, or we, we would remember a certain thing that, you know, that happened that was, you know, I tried to make things as light as I could because it's a heavy environment. It's a pretty heavy environment. And sometimes they needed to have, you know, a, a little dose of humanity in that environment. It's just sometimes it's, it's hard to get. I think it's in the jail now. It's more like that. Back in the day, it really wasn't. So, Jamie, it looks like from, so if I'm doing my calculations right, from about 89 to 94, you worked in the jail. Yeah. And then you go on patrol. Yeah. And so how does that, how does that go once you, you hit the streets? So that was, uh, that was an anticipated day that, that I really, really super anticipated, really was looking forward to it, but I had absolutely no idea what it would look like when it showed up. No idea. And uh, <laughs> um, I remember I was working in the jail, and it was, it was, we were working four days on, four days off, and it happened to be during the time of the Western Idaho Fair. And um, we had... Um, we had the opportunity at that time that if you wanted to work a little extra duty, um, you could, you could, you know, uh, you know, if I was a jail person, I could work 
along with a, a, a patrol person or whoever, detective or whoever, a commission deputy. Um, I could work in, in the, at the fair with those guys, walk on the midway or whatever. Um, I wasn't doing that on this particular day, but there were a bunch of those guys out there at the fair. My wife and I were at the fair. And um, and I would I don't I don't think there there might have been email I didn't have email I, I don't know computer no um, uh, but uh, somebody somehow that the, the the mail or message was created somewhere and given to um, uh, Pat Coles who was the uh, patrol uh, lieutenant. Um, and the message was, Barker's coming to your patrol team. He's leaving the jail and, and transferring to patrol. He's coming somewhere to find a spot for him and an FTO because he needs to have a field training. He's been through post, but because it's been four years since he's been through post, he's going to have to go to Law Week um, and, and get all that taken care of again. Um, and, and uh, he's going to have to do a PT as well, make sure that he's good to go. He's fine. Um, so uh, we arranged for the PT. Oh, actually, when I was at the fair, um, my wife and I are just walking along, and uh, some random deputy, don't even remember who it was, he goes, hey, you're Jamie Barker, right? I said, yeah. And he says, welcome to patrol. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> he says, yeah, you got transferred to patrol. What the hell you say? <laughs> and and uh, um, I, I get back home, because we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have cell phones back then. Um, I get back home, and there's a message on my machine from Lieutenant Pat Coles. And Lieutenant Pat Coles said, ah, uh, Barker. <laughs> uh, uh, you're transferring to patrol, and your first day on patrol is going to be this, but we got to get you through this first. And so, okay. Anyway, so I was assigned to patrol, and uh, that's how I learned about it. And then I had to go to post, do the couple little administrative things, get that out of the way. And I was assigned to a, uh, a field training officer. And my, my first FTO was uh, a guy who was, uh, was a very senior uh, patrol dude. He was an older fella, uh, a former chief at McCall PD. His name was John Lyons. And John Lyons was John Lyons was a fun guy. <laughs> I love John Lyons. He's uh, he's a retired guy now, but um, he, I didn't I didn't know him from Adam. Um, and so I I walk into the patrol briefing, and here's John Lyons. He's kind of a gray haired dude, glasses, um, and he's kind of got this look to him, you know, and and. Uh, I sit along the wall. Now, I'm not at the table. No, I sit in the chair next to the wall because <laughs> I haven't earned a spot at the table yet. Eh? It's all very Sons of Anarchy, right? Before Sons of Anarchy. I don't know. Anyway, I was in the chair by the wall, and um, I, didn't know, I, I didn't know what I was supposed to bring. But here I am. And uh, here's John, and he goes, you're Barker. Yep, yes, sir. And he says, okay, well, we're going to do a few things today. And uh, so he showed me how, this is, he showed me how to do everything. Here's the car. Here's the radio. Here's the shotgun. Here's how you clear the shotgun. Here's how you do check. He went, went through the whole thing, even how to check the oil. And he says, and what you're going to do at the end of shift is you're going to make sure this car is very clean. Every window inside and out is clean. The floors were vacuumed before we handed off because we didn't have take-home cars. You, had, you left the car for the next guy. And if you, if you left garbage in the car, you would find that garbage in your mailbox oftentimes. And I only did that once. I only had found garbage one time. Um, but he showed me all this stuff. And he had bags of things. He, he carried a typewriter with him. He typed his reports. And he had an electric typewriter that he carried with him. Um, he was a former chief. I mean, what are you going to do? He couldn't write, right? Um, <laughs> sorry, John. Um, so, 
anyway, here's here's John Lyons, and he's you know we go through uh, the first uh, the first night, and we were working we we're working a swing team, right? Um, so we're coming in. I can't remember when it was, like four in the afternoon, and getting off at two, two thirty, and uh, so we start our shift, and and uh, he says we're just gonna we're just gonna relax. He just made it very comfortable. He says this first this first few days we're just gonna relax. We're gonna get to know each other. That's all we're gonna do. And I'm going to show you some geography things. We're going to learn some of these streets. We're going to learn this addressing system that we have in Ada County, where the zero points are, where the numbers are. And we're just going to drive around and we're going to get you familiar with the county. Okay, sounds great. I'm paying attention. I'm taking notes. Yes, I am taking notes. We're doing all this stuff. And I noticed one thing from day one. He says, but before we do anything, I need my tea. Your tea. That's right. Okay. And so he would go to the wherever it was, the Circle K or whatever it was, and he would get himself a tea, a hot tea. It was a hot tea. He had tea. Okay. I got to have my tea. That's what he said. And so, um, and that was an every day. And so one day he tosses me the keys. He says, you're driving. Okay. So I'd had, I'd been working my map book. Stuff like that. I was paying attention to the numbering and I was listening to the radio. We didn't have MDTs back then. It was a taxi cab radio. And I had a legal pad. And I would write stuff down. I did have a micro cassette uh, tape recorder in my, in my press pocket here. And so that if, there, if there was a hot call or whatever, I could hit that and I could record the, the audio, right? And uh, so anyway... We're, we're going, I've got the car all outfitted and everything, and uh, we've gone to get John's tea. And uh, <laughs> we're, you know, we just had a good time. And so he was, he was, we were going through checklists and things like that and, and learning all that stuff that the Phase 1 FTO teaches the, the, the new recruit, right? And, uh, and so we do all that stuff, and I'm taking tests, and I'm doing everything, and, and, um, I think John was surprised because I can, I can write, um, <laughs> and I have no problems recalling what I saw and what, if I talked to someone, taking a burglary report or taking you know, different kinds of reports, I had no problem recalling specifically what they said. And so I could knock out a four page report in half an hour, no problem. And it was very accurate, generally speaking. And so he was impressed with my my report writing, um, so that was good. Um, and then, as as I as I move along, I got to uh, a phase two deputy. I'm not going to tell you his name, but I had to write the full thing: his first name, his middle initial, and, and it had to say senior deputy first, first name, middle initial, last name. Every time I referred to him in a report. Every time. And if it wasn't, he had, this is a guy, this is a guy who's in phase two. Phase two, you're supposed to st uh, stress your, your, uh, um, your recruit, right? Your, your new guy. And so that's what he was trying to do. He, was, he, was, um, he would sit in the passenger seat of, of the car. And we were driving the Chevy um, Caprices, the really nice ones with the uh, Corvette motor in them. They were really fast. Great car. Um, and he was sitting. He was sitting in the passenger seat um, with black isotoner gloves on. Had a red pen prominently displayed right under his badge. Um, and he would bleed all over reports, given a half second or any kind of notice. Yeah, oh yeah, he's bleeding all over. You got to rewrite that whole page. Um, and. Uh, uh, and he'd smoke a cigarette. You weren't supposed to smoke in the car, but he smoked a cigarette in the car. And he'd sit there and he'd look at me. And he, and he would, and and it didn't really. I guess it didn't really matter what the uh, what the situation was. He always had a remark, and it wasn't a positive remark generally. But he would he would give it in a really straightforward kind of 
like I'm talking right now, Barker. I think you're a stupid idiot. <laughs> Barker, that was really dumb. You know, that sort of thing. And, um, <laughs> and I'm just driving. I'm like, okay, well, whatever you say. Yes, sir. You know. And so I got through. I got through phase two. Phase three, uh, a really good um, FTO, um, Keith Bora. Um, and love Keith Bora. Uh, but he, when it comes to uh, self initiated field activity, um, it wasn't any. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't any. Um, and so um, he said, okay, well, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? Let's go do it. All right, let's go. And so for me in phase three is, so so as far as the workload in phase one, it's uh, phase one, the FTO has the burden of most of the of the work and the, and the trainee has about a quarter. Phase two, it's about half and half. In phase three, it's three quarters on the trainee and a quarter on the, on the TO. And so I'm, I'm, I'm doing the majority of the work. I check the cars, I'm handling the radio, I'm working the lights, I'm doing all the stuff, I'm making the D stuff. So we're gonna stop this car right here, and we're gonna do whatever. And so I was doing that, and we were having a good time. And uh, he had input, you know, here and there, and it was good, and I learned a lot from him. Um, and then we go back, and we go into phase four. And phase four is, is what they call EO. Evaluation only phase. And it's with my phase one FTO, John Lyon. Back to getting the T. <laughs> and John, John's one of these guys, of course, he was the chief at the call, right? He, was in, <laughs> he likes to control stuff. And uh, this is where it makes him a really good phase one FTO because he can walk you through as he's doing it with you, right? Um, well, in, in, in phase four, EO, he's not, he's not allowed. He's not allowed to do anything. He's, he is not even allowed to wear a uniform. Um, so he's wearing civilian attire. He's got a gun on and he's got his vest on. But civilian attire and he's not allowed to touch the radio and he's not allowed to touch the lights. He's not allowed, none of that stuff. He is simply sit there, they call it Wooden Indian and it's a two week period. So for Wooden Indian Weeks, they're just sit there and they're watching you do your thing and they're evaluating you. And at the end of the shift, they may give you some feedback on, okay, you could have done this better, or you should have done this, or whatever. And at the end of the two weeks, either you pass or you fail, right? Um, I passed, but, but John, every day, tea was the first thing. I got to have my tea. And so we'd go get his tea. And uh, then we'd take the calls and we'd do the things and I'd make the arrests and you know I hooked up DUIs and stuff like that with John watching. And it was fine. It was didn't he thought that was good, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, um, <laughs> we just we had it we had a really good time. One I will I will share one one little incident that occurred with John. Um, he he especially liked the Sunrise Cafe, and this was in phase one. Sunrise Cafe in, in uh, Meridian. We went there, checked out for seven, and John got the biscuits and gravy, right? Mm -mm. Biscuits and gravy with some tea. I didn't eat anything because we'd already taken a couple of reports and I was, I was down paper. I was sitting across from him at the table and I'm writing paper and he's like, oh, you shouldn't write while we're, we're having dinner. I said, yeah, I just want to get on top of it. So I write, you don't have to, that's fine. Um, you're on a break. I'll just, I'll just do it. So I knocked out the paper. He's eating the biscuits and gravy and I'm driving. And so we get back in the car and, uh, and I said, how was lunch? It was good. Oh, it was good. I said, I make great biscuits and gravy. It's great. So we're heading south. We're going from Meridian. We're going towards CUNA and, uh, um, they've got a substation out there. And at that time, back in the day, it was, it was a, maybe a, it's like a double wide mobile home. Um, that's what it looked like. It, it has offices in it, stuff like that. And, and we've got keys to it so we can get in after hours. And, uh, we're, we're driving southbound on highway 69 as we're going towards 
Cuna and John, yeah, he starts doing this. Oh. <laughs> I said, you okay, John? Yeah, nah, I'm, I'm fine. Okay, we're, we're still cruising along. About half a mile later, he's like, hey, you might want to step that up to code two. <laughs> I said, oh, all right. <laughs> so I might hit the gas a little bit harder. And uh, he's sitting there, and, and on our duty belts, we've got keepers that keep the belt in place on the, on the pants. He's undoing the keepers <laughs> as he's sitting there in the passenger seat. I'm like, <laughs> and he's like, just keep driving, just keep driving. And, uh, and so we get there, and he unbuckles his belt, his duty belt. And he just kind of leaves it right there. And he goes, okay, Barker, when we get there, just kind of pull up to the door. And you can go ahead and stay in the car. I said, no problem. I still got some paper to write. And so we kind of into the slide into the door. And... Uh, he he pops out. He's in and he's in the bathroom. There's biscuits and gravy. Good job. And <laughs> they came back and it was probably a half hour. He comes out and he's just white. <laughs> like uh, he gets out, he comes out and he's kind of leaning on the on the stair rail there for a second. And I pop out of the car. Are you okay, John? <laughs> he goes, I think maybe it's time to go forty two. <laughs> I said, get in the car. <laughs> In the car, we'll go 42. And I took him to the station and met with the sergeant. And I rode with the sergeant for the rest of that night. We were telling stories about John Lyon. <laughs> it was a good time. Hey, Jamie, so can you give me an idea? So from 89 to 94, you're on patrol. Yeah. Back in the day when you're doing that, is there a typical call uh, for you guys with Ada County? Or kind of, you know, it's a free-for-all back then. You get a little bit of everything. Yeah, we kind of got lots of everything, but the thing that was typical for um, the Ada County Sheriff's Office, especially working in the South County, which is kind of where I was, um, south of I-84 all the way to the, the, the county line south, right, um, is you'd get the loose horse call or you'd get the loose cattle call. One time we got a call, and I'm not kidding, it was a, there was a fox in the hen house. There's a fox in the hen house, and I'm like, and I'm on my own at that time. There's a fox in the hen house. Well, <laughs> oh, oh, 10 4. And so I'm going, and I get there, and, um, and uh, yeah, it sure as heck. Is, and it was not a fox, it was a raccoon in the hen house, but you know, just as bad. And so I'm like, well, um, uh, what do I what do I do about this? I I was raised in Boise, Idaho. Um, uh, I had an uncle that lived on a farm. I didn't. Um, what do what do you do with a a fox in the hen or a, a a raccoon in the in the chicken house? Well, um, yeah, I opened up the door and the thing ran out and uh, and I think that I think the, the farmer shot it. I don't know. I didn't. Um, and I cleared, <laughs> but it was things like that. Or um, I got to a point when I was on patrol um, that uh, I would carry, and, uh, and I'll back up a little bit. My wife at this at this time was enamored with the very expensive hobby of horses. Not a, I'm not a horse person at all. My wife less of a horse person now, but she liked a horse. And our neighbor had a horse and 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 she liked that. Well I live in a subdivision. My neighbor had a horse, but his he didn't keep his horse in the subdivision. He had it way over here somewhere else. Anyway, um so she she decided that she wanted a horse. Well uh, so I I learned about a, a grain bucket, a feed bucket. And you put a little bit of stuff in the in the you know some grain in the in the in the bucket. You shake that bucket, and it's horses. Oftentimes they'll they'll come right to you. All right. Well, what do you do with them? Well, you should put a lead rope on them. Is what I'm told. I don't have a lead rope. Well, what do you got? I've got hobbles that <laughs> I have tied around my 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 right ankle. I can undo those, and it's a it's a thing about like that long and. 
and I could I could put that around their neck and I could lead them somewhere. I don't know. Well, I mean, I faked my way through a lot of those things as best I could. Because um, I, you know, I'm not an animal person. I don't know. I'm a county deputy. I peed outside a lot. Uh, but, <laughs> I mean, I mean, all, all county deputies did, still do. Um, but, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know, um, you know, the, the, the animal husbandry and the, the, all of that stuff that, that, you know, some of these other people, I don't know what. Anyway, I faked my way through a lot of it. I survived. It was fine. Anything, anything exciting happened to you that you remember while you were on patrol besides corralling horses? Um, you know, um, so there was the odd pursuit. <laughs> uh, there was, in fact, there was at the time, there was an 18-month period uh, where I worked graveyard patrol, and I loved graveyard patrol. Um, uh, my wife hated it because we had little kids at that time, and she never saw me. Um, <laughs> but I loved it. And uh, but we would get into pursuits. You know, people would run from us. There were there were uh, the bad things. You know, you get you know the family fights, and uh, you know we had armed robberies and things like that. And, and we would we would go to those things. Um, uh, you know, bar fights at the uh, uh, in Cuna. You go to a bar fight. Um, I mean, and you learn. You learn. Um, there's a couple things you can do at a bar fight or a fight in general. Um, jump right in, or wait. <laughs> and sometimes, if you're alone, especially, it's bad. maybe you just wait. Okay. And when the opportunity, you know, presents itself. Well then, uh, sheriff's office, <laughs> you come with me. That sort of thing. You put handcuffs and, and go do the things. Um, uh, so so we had you know we had our fair share of of everything, um, uh, you know from from burglary reports, vehicle burglary reports to, you know the armed robberies, the domestic violence, the the murders, you know that sort of thing. We had all of that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just like being a cop anywhere, you know, where people are, that's where crime is. And, you know, it really doesn't know any geographical boundary. It just, they, they happen and we go to it. I guess the difference between working those things as a county deputy is that um, I was alone most of the time. So uh, we had a... On the, on the graveyard uh, teams that I worked, we had a sergeant, and then we had we had two areas. We had the north, we had, actually we had we had four areas. We had a deep south and a south county, and we had a north county unit and a deep north county unit. And then they took care of Eagle, um, and then we didn't really pay attention to East County um, that much. We just didn't. We didn't have the manpower, so we had a five person team, and the sergeant came out after he was done with his administrative things um, and it would be hours into the shift before we had a sergeant. So we had, um, uh, if you were working the south, you had a south area partner, but we were miles apart most of the time, miles and miles apart. So my assist might be, you know, anywhere from 15 minutes to a half an hour away. Um, and so in that, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with, you know, a, a person that is not being friendly, not being compliant. Maybe it's on a traffic stop, whatever. Um, you kind of have to um, reflect upon your communication skills that you learned in the jail, um, and kind of, you know, you know, save yourself by not committing yourself early. You know what I mean? Um, and uh, wait. You know, if, you, if you're going to get an assist, have them in route early. And, you know, that way when, when things are, are, are prone to get ugly, you've got an extra helper. I, I ended up, I, I kind of got, I kind of got into a situation where I stopped a DUI driver and he was combative. Um, but he had been in a little bit of a fender bender with a bunch of cowboys. Um, and these are, I mean, these are field hands and, and rancher dudes who 
Um, they're all wearing cowboy hats, um, and they their truck had been hit by this by this dude um, who wanted to fight me. And these guys are like anywhere from 15 to like 23, and all of them buff because yeah, they've been bucking hay, and they're tired because it's been a long day. And they want to go eat something. And so this guy bumps into him, whatever. They call the sheriff's office. I show up. I'm close. And I start running through FSTs, whatever. And he decides that he wants to turn on me and fight. Well, we start. And it, it was the shortest fight I think I'd ever been in. Because <laughs> these boys were on him. And I think there was a person on each limb of his body. And they're like, Deputy, where would you like him? <laughs> I said, well, thanks, gentlemen. We're just going to put him in handcuffs right here, and we'll go stick him in this car over here. And we did. And, you know, the thing is, the thing is this, I, I think. Um, as, as the sheriff's office, you know, the sheriff himself is an elected official, right? Um, so the, the sheriff, he has to have... He has to be somewhat popular in order to be elected to that office, right? He, you can't be, um, pardon my French, you can't be a dick and get elected being sheriff, usually, because, because people aren't going to elect people like that. Um, and uh, and so uh, one of the one of the foundational rules um, for all deputies, detectives, doesn't matter your assignment, is you never, never publicly embarrass or shame the sheriff. Don't do it. It will it's it's a bad thing to do, especially if it comes to, to election time, if you know the sheriff is portrayed or his office is portrayed in a in a negative light. So this is something that that we're told and it's something that we practice. Don't do that. Um, and so um, it's important then when you arrive at a scene like that with a guy that wants to fight you. Um, that I mean, and maybe I mean it could have gone the other way. I mean these guys could have not liked the cops like they do now today. Um, maybe, um, and it could have been it could have been a really bad thing. But fortunately for me, you know, we're very we're very at the sheriff's office very service oriented, and. Um, and uh, they liked they liked the the way that I was doing business and the fact that I was being their advocate, you know. And this is the bad guy that was that had injured them in some way, and so they were more than willing to help. And I found that um, because of the reputation of the sheriff's office um, and its positive reputation of the sheriff's office, um, that was the outcome most of the time. Uh, is that that people backed us up when we needed it. So Jamie, um, I'm going to take this time right now to just kind of talk to the listeners and viewers and just let them know we're going to make this kind of a, a two-part thing because we're going to start talking to you about your career from 98 to 2015 where you were a, a detective for 17 years. Um, you worked for uh, four years in property crime and then 13 years as a homicide detective. Right. And um, so we're going to make that uh, a part two here, uh, viewers and listeners, and uh, so you can uh, tune in uh, for episode two.